So Brad, let me uh, pivot back to the Jeffrey Epstein cases and share with our uh, listeners and viewers on YouTube uh, a little bit of our personal history and how we became involved in this case together. Uh, here's my memory. Okay. Um, I worked out at the gym across the street from the courthouse. You were at the gym. I knew you were a young defense attorney doing insurance defense at the time. And you knew that I was in the process of handling sexual abuse cases against the archdiocese, mostly archdiocese in Miami. Right. And I, I remember we used to talk about it and chat about it and all of that. And um, in about 2008, I recovered a $27 million verdict up in Palm Beach County against a man who had fondled uh, a little girl who was the daughter of a cl close family friend who he was watching. And that was a jury verdict. Now, um, I never ended up collecting anything on that, but it did get a lot of publicity. I know it was in the New York Times, and I believe that's where you saw it and called me and told me what? I remember telling you that um, Jeffrey Epstein had hired this cadre of lawyers, and it was just me. I was a solo practitioner, and you had this obvious knowledge of trying a similar type of case through trial. And could I pick your brain, and was there a, a way to kind of work together at some point in time? I remember, I, did, I said, who's Jeffrey Epstein? I mean, no one knew who he was at the time. He was pretty low key. Yeah. And uh, you explained to me that he's this billionaire, he's from New York, so I, I found it intriguing. I know we had lunch, I know we ended up working uh, together, at least at the inception. Those are things that I will never forget, especially since you've been good enough to memorialize them in your book. Yeah. And uh, I know I told you this before, but I'll tell you again. Um, I really appreciate the way that you wrote about me in the book. I thought it was really accurate and it was really thoughtful. So thank you for that. And um, I think it's the only book I've really been mentioned in to date, and hopefully the last. We, we really uh, tried so hard to just get it right. No, you definitely, you definitely did. And I will never forget those times working together. I remember going to a couple of attempted depositions of Epstein where he completely refused to testify, take the fifth, and uh, he I, was just a creepy guy. You know? I, I, I remember I took his deposition for about three hours one morning, and we broke for lunch, and you were at the Palm Beach Courthouse and stopped by the deposition on the way back. We talked in the lunchroom, and I think you went back up to the deposition room with me for the second half, and I asked about f five questions that he thought were so offensive that he got up and, and walked out. Weren't you in the he, room with he that? He did. When he, wasn't, well, when he wasn't invoking the Fifth Amendment in right. response to your questions, he was getting upset and walking out. I just yeah. know that the whole thing turned into a big nothing burger because that's the way that it got handled, but obviously he got his just desserts. But, I, Brad, I remember reviewing the evidence uh, that you had, looking through the flight logs, looking through all the evidence you have, and reading about this sweetheart deal that you mentioned earlier, uh, I mean, look, my, my feelings were, why isn't this guy serving a life sentence in prison for trafficking and molesting young girls? It's, I know it's a capital felony in Florida. I know that recently an, a statute was even passed that provides for the death penalty in cases of that nature. So it's, I'm thinking, why isn't he doing life in prison? Why instead did he take a plea to soliciting a prostitute, and he ends up doing weekends in the Palm Beach County Jail. I mean, what a total bullshit deal, bullshit plea, and it really, really bothered me. And I know it bothered you, because we talked about it. And I also knew that this wasn't over. I was especially upset with someone I had never met and didn't know, the state attorney uh, for Palm Beach County. Yeah. I, th I felt that he completely sold out. I, look, I knew that, uh, that Epstein had this all-star team, all-star team of lawyers, everyone from Alan Dershowitz to Ken Starr to a bunch of all these other dignitaries, as you would expect a billionaire to do. And, man, what a sweetheart deal they got him. But, of course, as it worked out, that was not the end of the story by any stretch. Yeah, well, so in 2008... Uh, I was I was not as jaded as I am now. You know, I believe that the justice system always worked, or at least it always it always did if you had good lawyers on both sides, um, and that 
nobody was above the law. It was th this was kind of my entree into you know things aren't always that way. Um, but when I got into this case, it was really because Courtney Wilde asked me to help her out in the criminal case. She was cooperating with the federal government. Um, she thought that there was this long um, investigation that was going on. She was getting letters from the government saying, be patient, there's a federal investigation. Um, you know, b basically don't bother us. We're, we're investigating this and we're gonna do something about it. Uh, and she came to me saying, they're not talking to me. I said, well, I'm a former prosecutor. This is gonna be easy. I'm gonna call them. They're gonna tell me that, yes, it's a federal investigation. He's going to prison for life, just like you just said. I mean, right. as a prosecutor, that's just what should have happened based on the, the, the evidence, not oh, just yeah. the allegations. So when I called the, the U.S. Attorney's Office and I was instead getting kind of a cagey runaround, um, they weren't telling me what was going on, not, not timing, not substance. I thought, okay, what can I do about this? And so I started reading on the federal acts that provide crime victims' rights, and there's the Crime Victims' Rights Act, which provides you basic rights, you know, a right to meaningfully confer with the prosecutor, to be treated with fairness, things that clearly Courtney was not getting. So I filed a, an emergency pleading uh, to enforce the Crime Victims' Rights Act, and I filed it as Jane Doe versus United States of America, and went and filed it in federal court. And that's what stirred everything up because it wasn't a civil lawsuit asking for money. It also wasn't a criminal lawsuit. Yeah. It was basically just saying something wrong is happening here and, and we need to fix it. Right. And I think you were trying to set aside the, the sweetheart deal that was made and at the time, to, I didn't to, vacate, know, right. to vacate the non-prosecution agreement they had arrived at. That's what it turned into. At the time, I didn't know there was a sweetheart deal. At the time, they, they just weren't talking to Courtney. So I filed this case and say, hey, look, um, something going, is going on behind the scenes that's illegal. The government's working something out with Epstein. I learned later that week through this very quick pleading process that it's already been worked out, that there's been this sweetheart deal, that there was a, a deal worked out behind their backs, which really was wrong. You know? so, so that was kind of the beginning of the Crime Victim Rights Act. And ultimately, the goal was it should be invalidated because it's an illegal deal. Right. And I know ultimately you won that case, although... And then he died. <laughs> and then he died. Yeah. So and, uh, we won that case. There was a determination that we were right. The government violated the Crime Victims Rights Act. Uh, what's the remedy? And so we were at the remedy phase where we were saying the remedy is you invalidate the deal. Now, Epstein had just been arrested. This is 2019. So we litigated this for 11 years before we get this ruling. He gets arrested and then he commits suicide. And then there's a ruling that, well, the remedy, it's moot. You know, so the case then ended. We did appeal that to the 11th Circuit and blah, blah. But he was dead, so anybody that we needed to enforce you know, the, the agreement against was no longer here. The, the word relentless just keeps coming to mind, and I just think that you are the epitome of relentless, and you have to be relentless as a litigator, but you take it and took it to a whole new level. And I know that we spoke about that in the beginning when we were talking about the mechanics of these sex abuse cases, and Basically, my takeaway is that I taught you everything that you know, and the rest... I appreciate that. ...you learned yourself, <laughs> right? In hindsight, I taught you very little, you know, got you off the ground a little bit, and the rest, that's all on you. Not on, not on me, and, and I'm, just, I'm just so proud that you were able to do that. You ended up with 71 of these individual victims you mentioned, the, uh, the class action case involving 250 victims as well, and... Um, Along the way, there were a number of other cases that I kind of refer to as um, offshoot cases, right? Okay. Um, there were many of them. I wanted to ask you about those as well. But I don't want to leave out your partner in justice, who I think owns as much of this as you do, Brittany Henderson. So can you tell our listeners about Brittany, who she was at the time, what her role was in helping you prosecute these cases and to interact with and support your clients, the survivors. Yeah. So um, in 2014, it was, um, I was working at a much bigger law firm, six, six partners, and uh, we had separate divisions. And I was essentially running our crime victim division by myself. And uh, I had a massive summary judgment project that I was working on in the Crime Victims' Rights uh, Act case where I was going through thousands and thousands of emails and documents 
and I only had a very short kind of turnaround period. So I called over to Steve Jaffe, who was my partner at the time, and said, hey, I know that we have a new intern. Can you send her over? I just need her help. She sat over there, and we spent two days. Each day was at least 12 hours. I think that she would tell you one of them was 20 hours. I don't always work all of our employees that way, but it was, uh, it was a lo- it was, they were long days. And we didn't have much time to talk about it. But I said, here's, here's what I want you to do. I'm going to dictate in kind of chronological order what I want the, the motion to say and just type it up. And after the second day, when I had gone through all of the documents and I thought we had a good kind of really rough lay it out on a piece of paper, I went over to the other side of the table and I saw that not only had she kind of taken my words, but she had drafted the entire very, very long, I'm talking with, with exhibits and everything, is hundreds of pages, a hundred pages, almost a final draft of a summary judgment. And I go, this girl's special. Like she, Turns out, that was 2014, fast forward, I can tell you, she's one of the smartest lawyers that I know, one of the very best lawyers that I know, and the best at speaking with and relating to and empathizing with victims. Hands down, I don't even know who second place is, because it's miles apart. I mean, she really is, we call her the victim whisperer, she is that. And, uh, and to be such a brilliant lawyer with so many other skills. So I told her after about a week after that project, I said, look, you have choices in your life. You know, you can do a lot of different things. I practice law to change the world and do it my own way. Mm-hmm. And you're going, to, you're going to make a difference in this world. You're going to be the best class action lawyer. You'll be the best mergers and acquisitions lawyer. You know, every big firm is going to want you. But I also want you. And this is fun. And it makes a difference. And she said, OK, that's what I want to do. Now... There came a point in time as we started working cases together and trying cases together that uh, she has been offered jobs from multiple big firms, including Boyce Schiller, like David Boyce personally, uh, including Searcy Denny. And there was even a time where we were working multiple cases with the FBI where the FBI tried to recruit her as an agent away from me, too. Can't blame him. And I said, look, I know that there's a reason everybody's going to want you. And so I went against my, my rule that I made when I started the firm is I'm not going to have any more equity partners. And I go, I'm going to have one. <laughs> because she's a true partner, like to the core, can't work without her. And as a team, y- you know, we have the same attitude um, and just s- same goals in mind. And she's just, you know, n- a special person, a special friend for all of our clients, and also just a special litigator and lawyer. And she really took a, played a large role, it sounds like, in everything that we've been talking about. Everything. In, in fact, I would say this. The Epstein Victim Claim Program would not have gotten off the ground uh, but for her. So when, I don't know if you recall this detail, but when Epstein died, all the money goes into his estate in the USVI. And in the Virgin Islands. You, yeah, right, in the Virgin Islands. The Virgin Islands says, wait, he was committing sex trafficking. All of the estate is ours because this is through a forfeiture proceeding. We are going to take all of this. Well, Brittany and I say, that's not fair. The money should go to the victims. So we got on a plane, went down for a hearing. It was a a probate hearing. And after the hearing, when all the other lawyers that were down there were trying to get on camera and interview with ABC, we walked to the attorney general's office, knocked on her door, physically knocked on her door, and asked for a meeting. She gave us a sit-down meeting. She said, you know, why isn't the money ours? And without disclosing the whole meeting, we said, look, not only should it not all be yours, it should be the victims. And here's the program we should set up so that they're not re-victimized during this process. Right. And if you don't want to just hear from us, let us come back next week. And Brittany has the brilliant idea of flying three victims back down to talk directly to the attorney general about why it's important that she releases her freeze on the assets so that we can get the program off the ground. And that's how it happened. I mean, it happened just because of her idea and thinking outside the box and figuring out how are we going to maneuver through this legal process that we don't really know down in the Virgin Islands. I was hoping that Brittany, being the brains of the operation, truly would have shown up today. I know she had other commitments, but as I mentioned to you, I'm not letting her off the hook. I really yeah, want her to come. Hook. I want her to come and appear on a, another episode with or without you. Yeah. <laughs> and we can hear her perspective on all this. Yeah, that would be cool. Uh, Brad, I'd like to visit with you on some of the offshoot cases uh, cases that happened, some of them during the Epstein cases and others after, right up until today. Uh, first of all, Epstein, as it turns out, had a little black book, all right? 
And uh, I remember when this came up about the little black book. First of all, as you've now discovered, what, what turned out to be in that little black book? Before we get into the story about how you got it. So, so now I, I understand it to have been uh, Epstein and Maxwell, Gillen Maxwell and Jeffrey Epstein's Rolodex, which included um, females who were trafficking victims, many of them. It included other, um, other abusers that were friends of Jeffrey and, and Gillen's. It also included uh, various contacts around the world many of whom, in fact, most of whom, were not involved in any illegal activity. So it was a very robust uh, Rolodex that had kind of the good and the bad and the in-between in it. It sounds like a real treasure trove of evidence, though. It was. In fact, um, the way that we got it, I was taking the deposition of Jeffrey Epstein's butler, uh, Alfredo Rodriguez, and I asked Alfredo Rodriguez if there was any uh, Rolodex or anything along those lines, and he told me no. Uh, and afterwards, not believing him, I had this sense that he was holding something back. I said to him in the hallway, hey, look, um, if you ever come across anything along the lines of what I'm asking for, because all of these underage females, they were being called every day. There had to be phone numbers. There had to be a list. It has to be somewhere. If you come across it, just let me know. And I got a call either that day or the next day, and it was a really spooky voice that he used. He said, hey, uh, he calls the office. I pick up, says, it's Alfredo Rodriguez. Uh, I have the Holy Grail. That's he, what he called he it. He called it the Holy Grail. He called it the Holy Grail. Right. And I said, okay, what do you mean? And he describes it. It's a list of the girls that were coming to his house uh, it's the list of the girls that were being paid in cash. It's then the list of the victims that you're talking about. It also has other abusers in it, and he went on to describe it. And I said, okay, I, I want that. I'll come, I'll come to you right now and get it. And he said, okay, bring $50,000 cash. I said, Alfredo, that's not how this works. I subpoenaed you. I subpoenaed you for this information. And so I went on trying to convince him he should just turn this over to me. He wouldn't turn it over no matter how many times. And I didn't think he was a bad guy. I thought that he was a good guy. But he told me two different ways. He said, one, I think this is very um, valuable. I stole it from Guillen's computer. It's very valuable. I could sell it for more than $50,000. So you should be willing to buy it for $50,000. Number two, it's my insurance policy. I know that they're not going to kill me if they know that I have it. So they know that I have it. I'm not disclosing it. Um, but I made it to where it's going to get disclosed if somebody does something to me. So it's my insurance policy. I said, I don't really care what it is to you. What it is to me is the evidence of the crimes that I'm prosecuting. So after going back and forth many times and getting a lot of other advice about what should be done or what could be done, I went to the FBI and said, hey, look, I have this, uh, I have this information. This guy's committing a crime. He's committing an obstruction of justice. Uh, looks like he was subpoenaed for it. He's not turning it over. He's trying to commit a crime. They said, would you wear a wire? I said, I would wear a wire. I would be a confidential informant. I'll do whatever you need. Like, we're here to do what's right. And if he's decided to be a criminal, that's on his own. I've given him enough chances. So we have the final telephone call, because I, I wore a wire for many calls. So uh, the final telephone call, I felt bad for him, because I knew he was being set up. And uh, the FBI had told me, okay, now just set up the call. It's at this motel. It's going to be, um, a, we're going to have the cash. He's going to have the document. We're gonna, going to exchange it. Just get the location right and the timing right. And I said, okay. And against the FBI's instruction, I said to him one more time, look, Alfredo, you're not a criminal. You don't want to be a criminal. I don't want to do it this way. Now, I do have, I do have a fixer that will bring you your money today, which was the FBI guy. Um, but I don't think you want to do this, and I'd rather not do this. And the FBI is looking at me like, what are you doing? You're killing our case we just put together. But instead, Alfredo says, I know I'm committing a federal crime. I know I'm a criminal. But you're helping me put my kids through college, and I'm not as bad of a criminal as Jeffrey Epstein. He continues going on the tape, just burying himself, which at that point I thought, I gave him more chances than I was told to give him. And he gets taken down. Uh, you know, the, the, so he showed up. He, sh he showed up. 
The FBI I wasn't agents there, showed up. FBI agent shows up. Undercover, of course. Undercover. They meet in a hotel room. Uh, Alfredo Rodriguez provides the holy grail. They give him the cash. They give him the cash, and then they take him down. They arrest him for obstruction of justice. And what became of his case? Yeah, so he, he went um, before the federal judge on the obstruction of justice charge, and initially he had a deferred sentence. He pled guilty to it, had a deferred sentence. He literally left the courthouse with his guilty plea and his deferred sentence, I think it was some probation, um, and drove to Miami, parked his car at an apartment complex there, went up to an apartment complex and came out with automatic, uh, machine guns and um, and ammunition, and was taken down. The FBI was still watching him. Was taken down again in the parking lot and said, "Look, you're you're buying illegal guns." Uh, so then he was arrested for illegal gun charges, and he says to them in the parking lot something along the lines of, "Yeah, but I'm cooperating in this uh, federal investigation," as if that was going to get him out. Now. I didn't, I was never told, even though I was a confidential informant at the time, and he was probably buying the guns for me. <laughs> at least that's what I've always thought. To use on you. Yeah, that's what I thought. You know, that's why, that's why I, to this day, think that it was the only reason. It, it's the only thing that makes sense. The government never even called to tell me. They, I read it in the newspaper that he was taken down. Wow. So I'm like, so I call the prosecutors and go, hey, nobody was going to bother telling me that this guy left, you know, finding out that I'm the confidential informant and went and bought, you know, machine guns. Um, and then ultimately, I think that you, you probably know, he, he ended up dying. He was, he was sent to prison and he died of, uh, mesothelioma. Um, I, I think that he, that he got either during his prison sentence or before, but, but that was the Alfredo Rodriguez story. Wow.